Hello and welcome to Sunday School at Cedar Lane United Methodist Church. Our lessons this month will be about those courageous prophets of change who spoke, spoke to truth to those in power, offered hope for the future, preached doom to their own nation, and even confronted their enemy's sin. In our own lives, we have to decide each day if we want to hear a lie or the truth. With social media, various apps, blogs, and whatnot, it's possible to hear whatever you want to hear. Paul in 2 Timothy 4 called it itching ears. But the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. The truth about ourselves can be very uncomfortable. Sometimes it hurts a great deal, but if it is given in love, and if we accept it, it always puts us on the right path. We always find peace in knowing and doing the truth. People in power have an even harder time listening to someone tell them they are wrong. In our lesson today, two kings are told the truth by God's prophet, but they don't listen. They simply ignore what he says. And one of, for one of them, his arrogance cost him his life. Our script, scripture lesson today is from 1 Kings 22, verses 15 through 23 and 26 through 28. But before we read it, we need a little background. Ahab was king in Israel. At the time of our story, there had been peace in Israel for about three years because Ahab had defeated Ben-Hadad of Aram and the 32 kings who had allied him, themselves with him. That didn't make Ahab a good king. In fact, he was one of the worst. He led Israel into sin, worshiping Baals and the starry host and every other thing in the world. And his wife was Jezebel. And her influence was part of why Ahab went astray. Our second actor in this play, if you will, was Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat became king in Judah in the fourth year of Ahab's reign in Israel. Now, Jehoshaphat was a good king and actually sought God. He followed in his father Asaph's, Asa's footsteps and continued to purge Judah of idol worship and Ashtoreth poles, etc. He also provided teachers throughout Judah to teach all the people the law of God. And the Lord blessed him with great wealth and honor. And the fear of the Lord had fallen on the, the surrounding nations. And they, those nations, brought Jehoshaphat lavish gifts. He was a good king who made a mistake. History is full of examples of kingdoms making alliances with each other by having their children get married. It's one method of trying to end hostilities between countries. You become family. You can't fight with family. Not really. Second Chronicles 18 adds some details that are not found in Kings 22. 1 Kings 22, of how the alliance was formed between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Jehoshaphat had one of his sons marry Ahab's daughter. Now we understand Jehoshaphat's purpose, but how can evil and good mix? Paul in the New Testament tells the Corinthians, don't be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can have and can light and darkness have? A little later, after her, her son Ahaziah was killed, Ahab's daughter took out her grief and anger by murdering all the princes of, in the line of David except for one, and he had been hidden. 
Now, King Jehoshaphat came down to see his son's father-in-law, King Ahab. King Ahab threw this huge party for him, slaughtered thousands of sheep and all sorts of stuff. And in all of this, there was a piece of territory that the Arameans controlled that Ahab wanted back. And it's at Ramoth Gilead. You know, that Ramoth Gilead was a sanctuary city for the tribe of Gad, east of the Jordan River. Now, Ahab had put a plan together with his advisors. And while Jehoshaphat was there as his guest, Abraham, Ahab asked him if he would join him in going to battle against Ramoth Gilead. Now, he's just trying to stir up trouble, that's what he's trying to do. And I found Jehoshaphat's answer puzzling. I wanted to ask, why in the world would he answer this way? His answer to Ahab was, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Basically, he tells Ahab that whatever resources he has belong to Ahab. Sounds like a sort of a covenant, doesn't it? In any case, he's given his word. So why does he make this commitment? Is it because of his son's marriage to Ahab's daughter? Probably why. Now, Joseph had agreed in principle to the plan, but wanted some assurance that God was in the plan. Ahab had... 400 prophets of Baal who were guaranteeing their success. But Jehoshaphat, eh, wait a minute, you sir a prophet of the Lord around here? So he wanted one of those. And Ahab said there was one, Micaiah, but he never prophesied anything good for Ahab. Micaiah's entrance is where we pick up the reading for today. And as this is one conversation, we're going to read the entire passage, and I've asked Crystal to do that for us this morning. So let's pray for her, and we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to me nothing but the truth in, in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he has never prophecies of anything good about me, but only bad? Micaiah continued, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all those prophets of yours. The Lord has, de has decreed disaster for you. The king of Israel then ordered, take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, this is what the king says, put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. Wow. I'm personally never thought of a prophet as being sarcastic. Uh, 
Micaiah did the unexpected, at least for us. He told King Ahab what he wanted to hear. Now, we can't hear it in the printed page, of course, but I am sure that Ahab heard the sarcasm in Micaiah's voice. Tell me the truth, said Ahab. Do you really want to know the truth? No, not really. This exercise was for Jehoshaphat's sake. From what Ahab said, this routine had played out many times before, always with the same result. Ahab didn't listen to God. The word picture that Micaiah uses of sheep on a hill without a shepherd gets the point across to Ahab that he is no longer in the picture after the battle. I can just kind of see in my mind's eye Ahab turning aside Jehoshaphat to Jehoshaphat and say, hold your soul. He never says anything good about me. What is amazing to me is that Jehovah's, Jehoshaphat never spoke up to Ahab or told him to listen to the Lord's prophet. He was silent. We would expect some kind of response since Jehovah's Jehoshaphat followed the Lord. Now, I am not going to try to explain the discussion in heaven. I don't know. I don't think anybody else does. But the idea is that true power lies in the throne of God. And we see the power of a lie on those who want to believe it. Judgment was about to fall on Ahab. So Ahab sent Micaiah to jail and told his son to put, put him on bread and water until Ahab returned. And Micaiah told, that it, told everyone, if Ahab returned, the Lord had not spoken to him. The prophets had to be 100% all the time in what they were saying. There was no little bit, I missed it here, or missed it there. Now, in a ploy, what was not part of our reading, in a ploy to evade Micaiah's prophecy, when they got to the battle, Ahab disguised himself before going into battle. He did not wear his royal robe. But the ploy did not work. Ahab did not make it back from the battle. He was hit by a random arrow and died from his wound. Afterward, the army of Israel did scatter and everybody went back to their home as prophesied. Now, the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders to only fight with Ahab. They started chasing Jehoshaphat because he was in his kingly robes. But when he cried out, they realized he wasn't Ahab and stopped pursuing him. Now, we don't know what he cried out, but they stopped pursuing him. As our author says, the struggle to relate to God's truth is a universal struggle. We know people who are like Ahab and don't believe or won't believe. No matter what encouragement or admonishment they receive, they will go their own way regardless of the consequences. We have to ask, is it a matter of pride? Is it fear of giving up control of their lives? Is it just pure selfishness um, saying to oneself, there is no higher power than me? Is it the trauma that a person has experienced in a life, in life, such as a combat veteran? A second group would be those who are like Jehoshaphat. They are trying to follow God, but they are reluctant to follow through with what they know is right when they have to make a choice, and especially if it's a public choice. Perhaps the choice for God will cause conflict or the loss of a relationship. These believers need our encouragement to do what is right in the sight of God at all times. Micaiah 
as God's prophet boldly spoke the truth of God, even when he, what he said was not going to be received. In fact, he was probably ridiculed. The question is, what will we do? As the author says, it's easier today to question the truth of God than it is to take a hard look at our own behavior and make the needed changes. Now, our current culture uses the phrase, my truth. It's a bit of a pet peeve for me, so forgive me, uh, but it's pet, just a pet peeve. In my opinion, it confuses the word truth with the word experience. It muddies the difference between truth and experience. When they talk, they're in reality, what they're talking about is their experience. In their experience, they have found this or that to work for them. However, what works isn't necessarily the truth. This attempt to make these two words the same also denies that there is any universal truth. All truth becomes relative to the person's perspective. There isn't a truth that holds true for everyone. If there is a universal truth, that would mean that there is a higher power, a creator to whom eventually they will have to answer. And it denies that there is a right and a wrong way to live. The truth that we have is that God sent Jesus to die in our place just so he could bring us back into relationship with him. Does it cost to follow God? Yes, in the sense that we choose him over our own selfish pleasures, but it also pays. It gives us an abundant life, peace and joy in our hearts. We know that whatever this life brings to us, he is with us. Through his Holy Spirit, he empowers us to live this life in right standing with him. And his Holy Spirit gives us the sure knowledge that we are his children, and that we will live with him forever. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week.